Content warning, this episode contains discussion about the murder of two girls. And I just want to stress that this episode will contain a lot of disturbing details about the crime scene in the Delphi murders case. So once we get to that point, we will let you know and just proceed with caution. So we're recording this on Monday, September 18th. Earlier this morning, the defense made several filings. The one we're going to focus on in this episode is a 136-page memorandum in support of their request for a Franks hearing. Again, a Franks hearing is when the defense says, the search warrant or what have you in the case should be thrown out because the investigative officers failed to disclose certain details or lied about certain things when they requested the search warrant. So this is a memorandum supporting their arguments for why the the search warrant in this case should be thrown out. It's a lengthy document, as I say, and it's quite detailed. It, it kind of falls into a few separate categories. The first category would be, uh, in our mind, their contention is that this murder was actually uh, a ritualistic murder carried out by members of a pagan Norse religion called Odinism. And they feel that these Odinists also, uh, for instance, they cite that in addition to the fact that the killing was carried out by Odinus, that that angle was not sufficiently investigated. And they also uh, say that some of the prison guards at Westville are associated with Odinism. And of course, Westville is where Richard Allen is housed. There's an Odinistic conspiracy at the heart of their theory of the crime, it seems like, is fair to say. That's fair to say. Uh, also, this uh, document goes into considerable detail about the crime scene. And the reason they do that is because it's been suggested that not only is suggested by the prosecution that not only is Richard Allen guilty, but perhaps he acted alone. And so the, the defense wants to make the case. Here's what the crime scene was like. Here's all the things Richard Allen or any lone actor would have had to do by themselves if they were acting alone. We don't think one person could have done all these things. So that's one reason why they go into the crime scene details. And another reason why they do so is because they want to stress what they feel are things at the crime scene which are somehow linked to Odinism. The third point they go to into in this document is the PCA itself. This is the PCA that was released explaining the case the prosecution made for why they believe Richard Allen was guilty, why they believe his house should have been searched, and so on. The defense talks about some of the details cited in that document as coming from witnesses, And it argues that those details were not cited accurately. Uh, Before we go into all of this, we should uh, note these are serious allegations. But we're going to be sharing the defense's point of view on these. We hope that the prosecution makes a public response to some of these as soon as possible. So we can share that with you as well. And then hopefully once we have both sides out there, it will be possible to try to determine the truth of these matters. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is... The Delphi Murders, The Franks Memorandum.
So where do you want to begin, Anya? Well, maybe it makes sense to start from the beginning. As Kevin mentioned, this is a very long document. So, you know, I'm sure there's going to be stuff that we miss and that we can maybe go back and circle back with later. Oh, and just as a bit of a stylistic note, we want to get this out to you as fast as possible. So we're going to be foregoing our usual little stylistic elements about, uh, you know, our little sound effects to denote quotes, just as a just as a heads up. This is a quote from this filing. Members of a pagan Norse religion called Odinism, hijacked by white nationalists, ritualistically sacrificed Abigail Williams and Liberty German. That is ultimately the thesis underpinning a lot of this motion. And it seems to be that that is going to be the thesis that's going to underpin the defense. Of course, it's worth pointing out that defense alert Defense attorneys are never obligated in their defense to point to someone else and say, that's who's responsible. It's not my client, it's that person. But sometimes it's easier for defense attorneys to win a case if they are able to do that. And so in in this instance, they are pointing to members of this Odinist group, some of whom they name. I think we'll, we'll probably name at least a few of them here and say, these are the people responsible. Yes, this is a good strategic reason to do this because you're offering the jury somebody that they can blame for the situation. Like, psychologically, there's power in that. Yes. Uh, and another thing they, they're saying in here is that prosecution uh, led by Nick McClellan has not been uh, forthright about handing over materials of an exculpatory nature and they cite some what they say are are instances of that there were a few law enforcement officers uh officers named click fair so that's former rushville assistant police chief todd click kevin murphy and the late greg ferency uh greg ferency was actually uh murdered yeah he was killed uh, there, there was that awful situation where there was a gunman, I believe in Terre Haute, who was like shooting outside of a law enforcement building and and he went out and was killed by that guy. But those three officers, according to the defense, heavily investigated the Odinist angle. And in fact, they prepared uh, an 85 page report tailing their investigative work. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from this document. According to the summary of Click's investigation that he attached with his letter, the Behavior Analysis Unit of the FBI determined that the individuals responsible for the homicides were involved in Nordic beliefs. This was news to the defense. No member of the Unified Command in charge of the investigation revealed this information to the defense during recent depositions. So... They're saying that they the the prosecution had this investigative material. They have this exculpatory material, exculpatory towards Richard Allen, right? But material that they say pointed towards others, pointed towards this Odinistic group, and they failed to share. That's it. a pretty serious charge because obviously discovery issues can undermine a whole case. We've seen Judge Gull in the past throw out cases based on discovery issues, so that's not a minor you know squabble that they're kind of raising there um that's pretty serious it's a pretty serious allegation i would wonder what how the prosecution would feel about that because uh you know again that's kind of a that's one of those very serious charges that can undermine something i'm going to read another quote uh not only did carroll county sheriff tony liggett fail to include all of this old night information in his october 13th 2022 affidavit for search warrant and not only did mcclelland and the unified command withhold exculpatory evidence liggett also concealed damaging witness statements that devastate liggett's timeline a timeline liggett needed to be true in order to place richard allen at the trail when abby and libby were abducted additionally liggett lied in his affidavit about the statements of another key witness further devastating Liggett's timeline. Richard Allen has zero connections to any pagan cult or pagan cultists, 
And furthermore, no forensic evidence such as DNA or electronic evidence links Richard Allen to the girls or to the crime scene, i.e. he is a completely innocent man. Okay, why don't you explain that? Well, basically what they're saying there, and we'll go into more detail about this as we move along, they're saying that when Liggett requested the search warrant, he mischaracterized witness information in order to obtain that search warrant. And we've done an episode on Franks v. Delaware, but essentially the whole point of this memorandum is to convince Judge Gull to toss out the search warrant in this case, and therefore the fruits of the search, a.k.a. the gun, which was ballistically linked to an unspent round found at the crime scene. So at the heart of it, maybe the thesis of this is that an Odinist cult murdered the girls, but the goal is underlined by what you just said, that Tony Liggett messed up the PCA and, um, you know, we need to throw it out there for so it's a flawed case, according to the defense. That's what they're basically arguing. Now, one thing I want I want to just throw out there, and this is more of a question about this whole situation for you, Kevin, and we're get, going to get, get more into it as we go along, but there's a lot about they didn't mention any Odinist stuff in the PCA, and that's bad. But they also didn't mention anything about Kagan Klein or Ron Logan, other suspects we know came up at different points. And so is it the job of a PCA to mention everything that's come up in an investigation? Or is there some room for, you know, let's focus on one guy? I think there's some wiggle room there to focus just on one guy. Yes, but there's some more specific allegations about problems with the PCA that do seem more salient, salient, potentially relevant. But I just I just want to note a lot of the PCA is. Why didn't they mention the Odinist stuff? And I guess I was just a little bit confused by that, given that there is room to focus on, you know, again, they didn't mention, hey, there was catfishing going on because, you know, they don't, they're not charging Keg and Klein with anything. I'm going to read another quote. Uh, not coincidentally, members, Odinists, of this same pagan cult are employed as correction officers for the Indiana Department of Corrections at Westville Correctional Facility. It is inside of the cold concrete walls of the maximum security unit of this dilapidated reformatory that Richard Allen is being threatened, intimidated, and mentally abused. So the argument for this conspiracy is that not not only did Odinus murder Abby and Lippy, but Odinus are currently going after Richard Allen in Westville and tormenting him, presumably because they want him to take the fall for the murders that their comrades in arms committed. Yeah, that seems to be what the implication there is. Right. So now let's get into this a bit more. I think a question we all might have at this point is, well, what is some of this evidence which the defense says links Odinus to this crime? So I'm going to read a bit more from this document. Sticks and tree branches were deliberately, carefully, and proficiently placed on each girl in a certain arrangement mimicking certain runes. At least one of the branches appeared to have its end cut off cleanly by some, by some type of tool like an electric saw, providing proof of a preconceived plan. Additionally, the blood of Liberty German was used as the paint to mark a tree with a rune that looks similar to the letter F. With a simple Google search, these runes would be identifiable as one of the many calling cards of this pagan religious cult. Okay, so we're getting some more disturbing information about the crime scene, and we'll be going into even further detail later. That's just kind of a preview. So they're saying that that's the primary evidence. The, the crime scene, the thing, the, the way things were left at the crime scene indicates Odinism in their minds. Yes. 
And certainly over the years since these tragic murders occurred, there have been whispers, sometimes public, that it was a bizarre and an odd crime scene. So for the first time, we're getting uh, some sort of an official confirmation of what that crime scene looked like, what some of these oddities were. Yes. I'll read a bit more from this document. Law enforcement's failure to actively pursue the obvious links between the crime scene and Odinism is confounding. It is even more confounding when days and weeks after the murders, a particular Odinite from Logansport named Brad Holder posted on social media images mimicking the very runes found at the crime scene, a crime scene unreleased and unknown to the general public even to this day. Who was Brad Holder? He was an Odinite whose son Logan had been dating Abby. Brad Holder's social media posts seemingly taunted the very police that refused to fully investigate him. The defense believes the court will be shocked at the number of clues or Easter eggs both before and after the murders that Holder openly posted on his Facebook page that pointed the finger to his involvement in the murders. Right. Brad Holder's a name that's come up before in the case in terms of some of the online chatter. Yeah, his his name has been mentioned. Uh, I, I've seen it mentioned on YouTube channels. I believe uh, uh, Rick's name mentioned him recently. I think there's been some Reddit posts about him. Yes, and I'd be curious about what information is is sort of verifiable about his son's relationship with Abby and and what the situation there was, because it seems like that's a huge crux of the theory here: the connection. Because um, I know, I, I think they cite his information, you know, information he gave to law enforcement at some point where he acknowledged that there was some sort of relationship there. But, um, you know, one, one obvious question with, with Odinists, who are, you know, potentially white supremacists, is, is why would, you know, the two victims are obviously white. You know, why would they be targeted specifically? And so I think... One of the underlying situations here is is the fact that there was some sort of personal connection there. Yeah, that's, that's what they are, are suggesting here. Uh, I'll read a bit more. The court will also learn that the Unified Command was aware of a very disturbing image on Brad Holder's social media accounts that actually mimicked the crime scene. On April 12, 2017, Trooper Joseph Ryan Winters received a phone call from a man in Georgia named Ryan Boucher who had discovered disturbing images in Brad Holder's social media account. Having somehow learned that Brad Holder's son Logan had dated Abby Williams, Mr. Boucher began reviewing Brad Holder's social media history. One of the images Boucher viewed on Brad Holder's social media account was an image of two women, either dead or posed as if they were dead, on the ground in what appeared to be a forest. Both women had tree limbs and sticks arranged on their bodies. One of the women had her arm stretched out above her head, similar to the way that Libby's arm was stretched above her head. Both women were clothed, and the stick and tree branch formations on these girls was different from the stick and tree branch formations on Abby and Libby, but otherwise it bore a very eerie similarity to the murder scene in Delphi. What do you make of that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of the discussion in the in this document really kind of seems to center around, you know, people gave in tips on people who said or did creepy things. And and to me, that's not really that surprising, given that, you know, we, we know there's been thousands of tips given on this case and a lot of what they're citing seems to be like internet sleuths it, who who kind of like uncovered things and were looking at them. And it, I'm not saying that that makes them irrelevant. I, I understand where they're coming from with that. But I also note that like ultimately if the evidence is dude is creepy on Facebook, there's a limit to what you can do with that investigatively in my mind. Fair. That's I and I think that's worth stating. That being said, when you when you hear about somebody doing creepy things who might have some sort of personal connection with the victim, that 
that's definitely interesting. It seems like, from what I'm reading with this document, Brad Holder came up pretty early in February of 2017 and was looked at pretty fast. What the defense is alleging here is that he was not looked at well enough. They should have looked at him more and stayed on him. And I think also what they're alleging, what I believe they may be trying to get at with things like this, is suggesting that where well, here's a possible case against Holder and the Odinites, isn't it a lot more compelling than anything we've heard against Richard Allen, who, again, they say there's no real connection of him to Odinus, there's no connection of him to the victims, and so on. One thing that kind of it comes down to is how much do we believe their interpretation of the crime scene? Basically, they're saying this crime scene is pure Odinism from the symbols, from the the branches laid out as ruins, and obviously you and I are not experts on Odinus, and we also don't have access to any crime scene photos. So it's hard to know what to do with that. Because that seems like something that could easily be interpreted one way or maybe another way. Like, it's not, it's hard to, you know, when it seems like there's a bit of a logical jump to, well, it must have been Odinus, so why wouldn't you look at these guys more? Our guy isn't an Odinist. And it's like, if if it's a crime scene, I, I can see why they're saying Odinism, but I'm also kind of like, that's a lot of weight to put on that. An interpretation of the crime scene. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier. It's really crucial to get both sides of the story. If their interpretation of the crime scene photos is incorrect, it would be great if the prosecution was able to make that case. Also, would love, unfortunately, as we mentioned, Greg Ferency is dead, but would love to get some more thoughts at some point from Click and Murphy about do they still think this? What are their feelings about why their lead didn't go anywhere that they were looking into? Is this a case of people who are on the right track who didn't get to go any further? Or is this a case of people who became committed to their own theory and kind of felt like it wasn't given enough due? And is that reasonable? Is it not reasonable? I'll be, I'd be very curious to see what role they end up playing. Cause it sounds like they could be more sympathetic to the defense. And that would be interesting you know, certainly um, a positive thing for defense to have in trial, law enforcement people who worked on the case saying, no, 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 they, this guy is innocent. It was this guy. So, I mean, that would be a pretty huge coup for them. Yes. In my mind. Uh, and now let's go. I'm going to read a bit more and we're going to get now beyond Internet sleuths. Unified Command was aware that Elvis Fields confessed to his sister that he, Elvis, was involved in the murders, even providing to his sister intimate crime scene details of which only those present at the crime scene would have familiarity. Additionally, Elvis Fields told his sister Mary on February 14, 2017, that he was present at the killings and that he, Elvis, now had a brother and was now part of a gang. In February 2018, Elvis had been questioned by law enforcement, but denied involvement in the murders. However, after being dropped off at his trailer following the questioning, Elvis turned around, walked back to the police car, and, according to the police report, asked the state trooper if his, Elvis's, spit is found on one of the girls, but he could explain it away, would he still be in trouble? The state trooper that heard Elvis utter these words, Kevin Murphy, was not part of Unified Command, but immediately relayed Elvis's disturbing question to Jay Harper of Unified Command. Elvis also admitted to a different sister, Joyce, that he had in fact spit on one of the girls. Elvis told Joyce that he, Elvis, was on a trail and a bridge with two girls that were killed, and that he was going away for a long time. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's a very interesting and salient moment for me because it's having somebody else admit to it, right? And what I would be curious about, first of all, the, the thing about spit, I really, I'm, I'm, this is my opinion. This is just my opinion. This is not based on any reporting we've done. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. I don't know what you're going to say. You don't know what I'm going to say. I'm just winging it. 
I don't I don't think that this is going to be a forensic case. I don't think there was any usable forensic evidence. I do, I don't think that goes either way at this point. So if he's saying, "Oh, I definitely spit on them," and then there's no indication of that, then I kind of feel like, you know, that may have not been super impressive for investigators who know. Well, there's no evidence that of of that at the scene, but definitely, like I I'd, I'd want to know, like th- with this guy, like what's what's his deal? Does he have some sort of criminal background? Is is does he have some sort of mental illness? You know, what kind of person is just saying stuff like this to their sister? Like what the heck's going on there? You know, like I don't know. Like that's just my. But yeah, this this part definitely stuck out to me as being very interesting. Because yeah, I, I remember when uh, you've discussed uh, the so-called Richard Allen confessions. Richard Allen wasn't confessing to detectives mm-hmm. after being browbeaten. He was confessing to family members allegedly. Yes. And here you have this guy confessing to a family member. Yeah. It's not a situation where you're being bullied into something or, you know, I mean, certainly not, I would not imagine it's not a situation where you're like in prison and trying to sound tough. It's like, you know, your sister's not going to be impressed with this. Um, So I, I'd want to know, like, does this person have a history of making horrifying statements uh, do they have a history of violence? All that sort of thing that you would want to know about someone like this. Why did law enforcement kind of eventually drop them? What would be the reason? Like, was there something they felt like, okay, he's just full of it? Or what's going on there? Uh, and Elvis Fields is someone that uh, the defense believes can be linked to uh, Brad Holder. Uh, another person they believe can be linked to Holder is a man named... Uh, Patrick Westfall. In 2019, Unified Command learned that in a totally different conversation with his ex-wife, Amber, Brad Holder pointed the finger away from himself and directly at Patrick Westfall as being the person actually responsible for the murders of Abby and Libby. According to police reports, Brad Holder told his ex-wife, Amber Holder, that Westfall and his people killed Abigail Williams and Liberty German because one of their mothers was mixing with other people outside the mother's race. Furthermore, Unified Command was aware that Brad Holder had told Amber that I can only protect you so much if you keep asking questions. Brad Holder further told his ex-wife Amber that Patrick Westfall had many people backing him, Westfall up, and that Westfall also had powerful friends. So what do you make of that? It's interesting. It's it's definitely more on the hearsay side of Holder allegedly telling his wife this. His ex-wife. His ex-wife. Yeah, I'd, I'd wonder what the situation there is, actually. But in addition to that, it's, you know, what, you know, it, is, is he the most trustworthy person if we're saying he's involved, too? I don't know. But I, I can see where they're trying to kind of build out a web of, like, people around Holder. He seems to be the centerpiece here. Yes. At least according to uh, their interpretation. Yes. And in fact, at one point in here, if I remember correctly, don't they compare Holder to like Charlie Manson? They literally compare him to Charles Manson, noting that while Charles Ma- Charles Manson did not, you know, go to prison for stabbing anybody, he went to prison for inciting people to murder and stab and do all sorts of awful things. So kind of an interesting uh, comparison. And they raise that later on because uh, Holder seems to have an alibi. Yeah, he, they, although they they note that he has an alibi, but then maybe surmise that he, someone could have clocked in and out for him. Yeah, he was at work. Yeah. And he was clocked in at work. So that seems to kind of be trying to, cut, you know, cover. Okay, well, yeah, he, he, he was very well, you know, very well could have been at work, but here here's how he still could fit in. Yeah, that's that's what any good lawyer would do. They, yeah. they would say, well, they say he was at work. We're not sure he was at work. But even if he was at work, he could still be he could involved. still be involved. Yeah, because you need Holder. You really need Holder for all of that. Because, I mean, otherwise, it's just a bunch of random guys. But with Holder, you're drawing some of these links and you're able to have something a bit more cohesive. And I'll also, well, before I move on, I'll mention that uh, a while ago we actually reached out to Mr. Holder. 
Yeah, a long while ago. Because we'd heard his name brought up in connection with this, and uh, he never got back to us. Yes. Our message was read, but never responded to. Yeah, I wonder if there'll be any public response from the men directly named in this. What do you think? I would imagine that the first thing they would do would be to get attorneys. Yeah, I w- yeah, get a lawyer and start making some pretty angry noises, I would imagine. But that assumes that, you know, I mean, like, I mean, we we know from experience, like, it's expensive and time consuming to deal with something like that, so... Uh, that that's not necessarily what's going to happen here. But if if someone starts, if attorneys start filing motions saying you're involved in a murder, it's a smart thing to do to get lawyers to protect your interests. Yeah, definitely, because this is trying them in the court of public opinion. I mean, that's what the defense yeah. is doing here. I'm not saying that as a criticism of the defense. They're they're defending their client, but in order to do that they're going to need to try some other people in the court of public opinion. And uh, that, that can obviously be pretty damaging too. I'm going to read a bit more from this. The evidence shows that during his pretrial incarceration at Westville Correctional Facility, Richard Allen has been monitored, intimidated, and mentally abused by correctional officers who are also members of the Old Knight cult. Two of those correctional officers are named Sergeant Robertson and Sergeant Jones. These Westville Corrections officers boldly wore patches on their Department of Corrections uniforms that were claimed in Odin We Trust, along with another patch displaying symbols of Odinism interlocking triangles. Both Odinite correctional officers, Sergeant Robertson and Sergeant Jones, also display images of runes and or other old night symbols on their Facebook pages. As recently as June 25th, 2023, for example, old night Sergeant Robinson openly displayed a photograph of his old night altar on his Facebook page. A similar altar can be found on the Facebook page of Brad Holder. Right. So here's where the conspiracy gets more far flung. It's not just a conspiracy of murder. It's a conspiracy to continue to harass and sort of seek out a so-called patsy in in Richard Allen and to basically what they describe in this document is harass and frighten him to the point where he confesses to the murders. Yeah, uh, uh, we remember in the June hearing they talked about how their their, their conferences with Richard Allen at Westville were recorded through a glass window where they where the camera picked up the images of Richard Allen's mouth as he was speaking. And the suggestion is that they were monitoring, seeing what he was saying to his attorneys and such. Over and above any allegations that these guards are mistreating or abusing Richard Allen. If prison guards are wearing patches announcing an affiliation with a white supremacist group, that's a problem. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, that would mean that's that's not who you want being a corrections officer, especially in a situation where, you know, many prisoners may be people of color. Right. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Huge red flag there. We've talked to some former prisoners, former inmates who indicated to us that you could get into situations where you, you know, not, not that this was common, but that you could get into situations where you had correctional officers who were quote unquote down with a specific gang. So Aryan brotherhood, for example, you get a CO who's sympathetic, who's down with you. Maybe they do a bit of muling for you on the side for some money. So, you know, you can have that with different types of gangs. So I imagine that that would require you to be somewhat, unless you're totally in it for the money, somewhat ideologically sympathetic to, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's something to kind of keep in mind just because we, you know, we were curious about that. Like, would, does this sound realistic to folks that were incarcerated? And that was sort of the response we got that you might have some alliances between COs and prisoners. Yeah, and certainly in our reporting, we've talked to uh, 
former prisoners, current prisoners who've indicated that Odinism is a thing within prison walls. Yeah, there's that and white cer- supremacist. And certainly Odin. some prisoners would have like weekly Odinite meetings and such. It's definitely a real thing. That's fair to say. Yeah, but for guards to openly advertise their affiliation with a white supremacist group. Yeah, that seems incredibly inappropriate if that allegation is correct. Because, again, you're working in a setting where that's just, I mean, to be putting a, you know, basically a billboard out there about your horrific beliefs. (laughs) That's not good. You know? I suppose I I would add I'm sure there's some I'm sure there's some people out there who are pagans and maybe uh are are knowledgeable about the Odinist element that are not white supremacists so we certainly don't want to offend anyone in that set but a lot of it seems to have been co-opted by white supremacists. Yes. Yeah. And again, like if you wore your like, you know, I love the clan badge to prison, I'm sh- you know, like it's kind of like the same thing. Yeah, it's it's, it's troubling. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see if uh Westville responds. One thing about this, although I do find it very disturbing, I I'm curious is, you know, the more you build out a conspiracy, the the larger it gets, it feels like the harder it is to keep a lid on from the perspective of the conspirators, but also from the perspective of people, you know, talking about it, it becomes more and more outlandish as far as proving it, right? Yes. Like if I say... Okay, it, me and a couple of people conspired to murder somebody. Okay. But then also the prosecutor was in on it. And also, you know, the mayor was in on it. And, like, the more people you add to that conspiracy, the the more unrealistic it frankly sounds. So, you know, I will note, though, in this situation, they're saying that, you know, people associated with the defense team are willing to say, yeah, I saw those badges that were on these guards. So... That's one thing to keep in mind, but... And if these guards actually have Old Knight altars and and Old Knight symbols on their Facebook page, that's not something that... I mean, that's out there in the open. I wonder, though, is it possible that all these people are just racist and interested in Old Knight symbolism and not actually connected? As far as, like, the killers texting the correctional officers saying, hey go after this guy hard so we can get away with it. I I don't even, it's, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I I'm don't just, know the I'm just that. saying, cause I, just when you say it like that, it sounds kind of, it sounds like a lot, but if you're saying that a bunch of people are bad and racist, that sounds maybe a bit more realistic, just in my opinion. Yeah. It'd be interesting for us to look into old night subculture and see how closely linked these people are. Uh, I know certainly we've learned a lot over the last couple of years about people interested in child sexual abuse yes, materials. Yes, And that is such a niche interest that if you have that interest, you try to find other people to share it with and you form little networks. But and, at and- the same time, there's a real – in true crime, there is a real – desire to connect everything in a way that oftentimes, you know, every time somebody – after Kagan Klein got arrested and, and after the Kagan Klein news broke, then it turned like everyone who was arrested for child sexual abuse materials in Indiana had to be part of the same ring. And, you know, no, that's not how it works. Like there's there's things that are unrelated, even if they're similar. Yes. And this may be unrelated, but at the very least, it's it's a bad look. When there's details of the crime scene, which we'll get into, which seem to link the case to Odinism, you have the FBI supposedly preparing a report linking the crime to Odinism, and then you have Richard Allen in prison being guarded by avowed Odinists. That doesn't look good. Yeah, it does. And also, I just don't. People shouldn't be wearing Odin badges in prison and and holding that you know 
white supremacist beliefs in working in a prison. That's just not good. That also just makes you wonder. But, but then again, it, it is an allegation it's by an the a- defense, you know, so I, I don't want to necessarily just say, oh, yes, these people definitely must be racist and bad. Um, but yeah, I, I would wonder what sort of environment where y- you feel comfortable. Oh, I can wear this, this racist symbol when I go into work and I won't get into any trouble at all. It'll be fine. That says something about the workplace, doesn't it? I mean, yes, if the allegation is correct. If the allegation is correct. Uh, The document then talks a bit about PCA, but I think we'll get to that uh, more a little bit later. Uh, Now now we get to the crime scene. Uh, I will. Yeah, this is really horrifying stuff. So. I would say, how far can people jump ahead if they don't want to listen to any of this? You want to say like five minutes? Yeah, five minutes. I'm going to read from this document. When members of a search party found the girls in the late morning of February 14th, 2017, Abby and Libby had been missing for approximately 22 hours. The scene was ghoulish. Libby was found at the base of a tree with four tree branches of varying sizes intentionally placed in a very specific and arranged pattern on her naked body. Libby was positioned flat on her back, with her left arm stretched above her head, touching the base of the large tree. Libby's right hand was covered in blood. Libby's left hand was covered in blood. Blood spots and blood drippings were seen all over Libby's body, from head to toe. Libby's right arm was placed along the side of her body. One large tree branch had been placed on her left shoulder. This branch was so long that it extended above Libby's head several feet and below her legs for several feet as well. Two smaller branches formed a V where her legs joined her body near her genitalia, with both sides of the V extending upward towards Libby's head, with one branch extending to the left of Libby's head and the other to the right of Libby's head. The last of the four branches extended across Libby's body on a line from her right shoulder to her left shoulder. This fourth tree branch also connected with the other three branches and was placed under both branches that formed the V. Libby's sliced neck was partially covered by this fourth branch. There appeared to be no blood sprayed or dripped onto the leaves of the tree near Libby's head and sliced neck. It appeared likely that Libby had been killed at a nearby tree and then dragged to her final resting place, where she was then positioned before having the tree limbs placed on her in a very specific pattern. The murderers treated Abby very differently. Abby was found just a few feet away from Libby. Her body was not placed parallel to Libby, but rather at an angle, with Abby's legs just a few feet from Libby's legs. However, both of their heads were found a few feet farther apart from each other. Significant differences existed between how Libby's body was found and how Abby's body was found. Abby was not found at the base of a tree. Abby was fully clothed. In fact, Abby was dressed in Libby's sweatshirt and jeans. No blood appeared on Abby's clothing, meaning that she was likely murdered while naked and then dressed by the murderers after she expired and after the blood had stopped spilling from her neck. Abby's hands were clean no blood. Abby's feet were clean, no blood. Other than blood found around Abby's neck where the murderers had inflicted the fatal wound, very little of any blood was found anywhere else on Abby's body or clothing. The juxtaposition of the spots and streaks of blood found all over Libby's body with the lack of blood on Abby's body undergarments, overgarments, is stark. The murderers appeared to have gone to great lengths to keep Abby's body and clothing clean from blood. Abby was found on her back, like Libby. However, unlike Libby, Abby's elbows were bent with her right and left arms both placed on her chest. Abby's left hand and arm near the left side of her face, and her right hand and arm near the right side of her face. Also, Abby's left leg was straight, while her right leg was bent at the knee. The murderers also placed her bent right leg under her left leg. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to skip a, a part here. Uh, Uh, in addition to the unusual way the girls were posed, including the stick formations placed on their bodies, another unusual marking was found on a nearby tree. A symbol that looked similar to the letter F appeared approximately four feet above the base of the tree. The F was red in color, and later DNA testing showed that the F had been painted on the tree using Libby's blood as the so-called paint. So... That sounds like a very unusual crime scene where there was a lot of horrifying, horrifying, bizarre touches to it. I mean, just I just I just feel so sick reading about this. Like we've been covering this case for a while now. This is the most detailed information that we've gotten on the crime scene. And it's just heartbreaking, to be honest. Like, I don't know. Like, I would think, I didn't think I was going to react this way because it was like, we know whatever happened to them was horrifying, but just reading about it, just, I don't know. It's incredibly sad and depressing. Yeah, it's terrifying to think of the last moments of those two girls. This is a sick, 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 sick world we live in. Um, Yeah, and so we're getting a sense of, okay, here's why the defense is centering Odinism. They note that the F symbol on the tree painted in Libby's blood is, uh, they feel similar to a, a ruin, a Nordic ruin that looks similar. And they're saying that the branches are kind of ruin-esque as well. That ultimately comes down to an interpretation that I feel like we can't really assess. Yes. Either way. Uh, they also note that it would take a while to do all of this. Yes. This Especially is one thing that is compelling. This is like a interesting bit of it because why don't you explain that? Could one man have done all of this to these Poor girls in a relatively short time acting alone, you know, undressing them, killing them, redressing Abby, all of this stuff in such a short time. And and basically, I think the timeline they give it, th- the person is 213 approximately is when they're abducted. And then the killer is seen at 357 on the side of the road. That sounds right. So... Not a lot of time to do that. And, you know, I'm looking at this as a writer. They're they're kind of going into detail about all the tasks the killer had to accomplish in order to stage the crime scene and then, you know, kill the girl, stage the crime scene, and leave. It's and a long list. It's a long list. And obviously they're writing it in a way that is meant to be like, you know, dividing out everything and make it sound like it would be an inordinate task. So... I don't know, maybe maybe there's a way to do all this, but it's it certainly they did a good job of making it seem like it would be hard for one person to do in their description. And they also note the awful detail that uh Abby, the way she was attacked, her death would have been slow, while Libby's death would have been quicker. And so uh, I suppose that might support the theory that perhaps Abby was the one who was the target, which would fit into their theory about Holder. And this is where interpretation becomes important, because you could also say, you know, Abby was carefully redressed. Her hands were kind of left almost folded, it sounded like, whereas Libby was left naked. And so that that would almost show less respect for Libby. You know, and it was Libby's blood that was used. Yeah, to so I, I feel like that where we get into the interpretation is where I feel like it's kind of like, I don't know. I imagine that could go different ways based on different people interpreting it differently. If you if you look at the F as a ruin, yeah, Odinism. Got to look at the local Odinus. If you look at that as an F, maybe it points to something else. If you look at the crime scene as somebody putting branches in sort of a ceremonial manner, then perhaps you can look at 
as a religious sacrifice. If you look at it as just a disturbed mind doing whatever a disturbed mind wants to do at that moment, then perhaps they seem a bit more random. So yeah, that that's an area where we're kind of like keeping in mind that different interpretations may lead to different areas. I'm going to read a bit uh, here. The detail surrounding the February 14th, 2017 crime scene was a well-guarded secret hidden from the public. Yet somehow Brad Holder, an old knight whose son dated Abby Williams, had one, an image on his Facebook page that closely resembled the crime scene, and two, appeared to have used an ink pen to draw a rune on his hand that mimicked the very rune that was found on Abby. Both images are described in a police report. What do you think of that? Well, what do you think about it? I've been yapping this whole time sharing my opinion. It's interesting. I would love to see both of those images. Yeah, it could mean everything, could mean nothing. I guess like that's what <laughs> that's what everything is. Could mean everything, could mean nothing. I mean, you got to look into it, but I'm not willing to come out and and based on this one filing and say yes it must be the odinus right but certainly these are serious allegations and i really uh hope that uh the prosecution responds to them publicly i'm going to read some uh, more here now i'm going to move on to the details about the pca which as we all know was written by now sheriff tony liggett for Liggett's timeline to work and to place Richard Allen on the Monin High Bridge at 2.13, the time of the famous Down the Hill video, Liggett desperately needed Betsy Blair to describe a man on the Monin High Bridge that looked like Richard Allen, and perhaps more importantly, needed Betsy Blair to describe a car that she observed parked in the CPS parking lot at approximately 2.15 p.m. is looking like Richard Allen's black Ford Focus. Betsy Blair's description of the man she observed on the Monon High Bridge around 2 p.m. looked nothing like Richard Allen. Liggett concealed this information from Judge Diener. Betsy Blair's description of the vehicle she observed at the CPS parking lot looked nothing like a black Ford Focus. Liggett also concealed this information from Judge Diener. For good measure, Liggett also lied about what Sarah Carball observed at 3.57 p.m. that also blew up his timeline. All right. So basically, this is where I, I feel like <laughs> this document is kind of interesting because on the one hand, it's it's outlining the defense's case. They're saying it's the Odinus. But here's where we really get to the meat of the Franks aspect of it, where you're saying here's where Tony Liggett misled everybody on the PCA. That That means the fruits of the search need to be thrown out. Yeah, it feels like up to this point, they've been saying, well, here's some things that we think should have been in the PCA, but weren't. Which honestly didn't even make any sense, as I said earlier, because the Keg and Klein element, the Ron Logan, like, you can't put everything in a PCA. You're going to put what you feel points to the guy you think, it, you know, that you're going to charge. But here's where you get into, okay, maybe, you know, is there a problem with Here's the, PCA? the things in the PCA that shouldn't have been in there or that were twisted to appear differently when they were in there. Also, I want to note with this, with with them, um, you know, I, though I feel like the earlier part of this was playing to the public, playing to the public that follows the case. You know, it's Odinus. It's a ritual sacrifice. It's a cult. It's a conspiracy that's wide ranging from different parts of Indiana right into the Department of Correction. This is for the judge. This is for the court. Here's where we're getting into the, the legal issues at play here. So that's how I kind of divide them up, I guess. I'm going to read some more from this. On March 7th, 2019, Liggett was present when Betsy Blair described the man she observed on the bridge. Betsy was actually talking to Liggett face-to-face when she provided the description. Liggett heard Betsy's description of a much younger man with brown, poofy hair, but chose to conceal this information from Judge Diener. Blair's description of a youthful, boyish-looking person in his 20s, maybe early 30s with brown, puffy hair, obviously does not at all describe Richard Allen. What do you make of that? 
So I think that you you said to me earlier today, Kevin, that if if it's true that the PCA kind of purposely misled people on, you know, uh, the judge on on some of these aspects, then there could that, be, that could be a problem. That could be a problem. Although we agree that I think we'd we'd be more interested in hearing the prosecution's response to this before making any judgments ourselves. But hypothetically, that would be an issue. Yeah, basically, if you were a witness and my home ended up being searched based on you being represented as telling the judge that you saw someone with dark hair and glasses doing something suspicious and, oh, that fits Kevin's description, let's search his home. And then it turns out you actually said you saw somebody with blonde hair. Uh, That might be a problem. Right. Right. So. so that's interesting. Okay, there you go. I will read a bit more. Richard Allen stated that he, Richard Allen, arrived at the trails around noon and left around 1.30 p.m. Liggett failed to inform Judge Diener that Richard Allen stated he had left the trails at 1.30. He should have, especially if there were evidence that a different vehicle was parked at the old CPS lot after 1.30 p.m., but before 4 p.m., which would then support Richard Allen's statement that he, Richard Allen, left the CPS building around 1.30 p.m. So the next question to ask is, did anyone see a vehicle parked at the old CPS building between 1.30 and 4 p.m. that did not resemble Richard Allen's black Ford Focus, thus supporting the timeline that Richard Allen provided to Liggett, but which Liggett concealed from Judge Diener? The answer is yes. Betsy Blair. And then they go into uh, Betsy Blair describing seeing a vehicle at the CPS store at around 2.15 p.m. that did not match the description of Richard Allen's vehicle. So they're just saying that, you know, you shouldn't have cited this because it the underlying witness description disputes what's in the PCA. Yeah, if you have a witness saying, I, I saw a person there at this time, and I saw a vehicle that looked like this person's vehicle, and then it turns out the description given does not seem to fit, and the description of the vehicle also doesn't fit, that could be a problem. And you can make the argument that, you know, witness sightings and sketches and all that are inherently, inherently problematic because human beings are so fallible when it comes to remembering what they saw but the underlying argument is not that the underlying argument is like it shouldn't be in the pca then if it's not matching because then you know somebody's rights were violated essentially yes now let's move on and talk about witness sarah carbaugh who sometimes is called uh muddy and bloody witness because this is the witness who saw someone uh allegedly muddy and bloody walking along the road not long after the murders are said to have occurred. So now I'm going to read. Nowhere in Sarah Kabaugh's 2017 interview does Sarah Kabaugh use the word bloody to describe the clothing that the man was wearing. Nowhere. The so-called muddy, bloody lady is actually just the muddy lady. Is Kabaugh only used the word muddy to describe the man she observed on 300 North in her 2017 interview. It's certainly what helped Judge Diener in making his decision if the man walking down the street was wearing a blue jacket and also wearing bloody clothing, is if he had just murdered someone. However, Liggett just flat out lied. Sarah Carbaugh never mentioned a blue coat and never mentioned blood in her 2017 interview. So what do you make of that? I'll tell you one thing that jumps out at me. Okay. Stop asking me what I make of that. Go ahead. I'll tell you one thing that jumps out at me. He, uh, they say that Sarah Kabaugh never mentions a blue coat. And then they say Sarah Kabaugh never mentioned blood in her 2017 interview. So I wonder, did she mention blood in other interviews given in other years? That's what I was wondering, too. That 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 date stuck out to me. If she obviously the closer the interview that's closest to the event is going to be 
considered the better interview because memory, your memory is fresher. But I would imagine that if she later on said, well, I thought it was mud at the time, but could have been blood. I imagine that that would be different. I, I imagine that that would probably be acceptable in a, in the PCA. Am I right? Or uh, everything's up for debate. Oh God. <laughs> And they also say that uh, she uh, didn't describe seeing a blue coat. She says she saw a tan coat. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, maybe you say eyewitness testimony is always problematic. Yeah, it's just terrible. And, you know, that human being, like, none of us are paying attention half the time. And, and you never know what's going to be important. So it's really, it's not like anybody's fault. It's, you're not driving by thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be really important later. You're just like, that's weird. And then later on, it becomes highly relevant. I'm going to read a bit more. Uh, They don't teach you in law school what to do when your client, who was accused of murder, is being guarded by members of a religious cult whose members, evidence strongly supports, were the actual murderers. Yet that is where we are. At some point in time, coincidences cease to be coincidences. So I thought that was an interesting way of uh, phrasing things. At some point, coincidences cease to be coincidences. Uh, It's interesting. If this theory of the case turns out to be true, then all the stuff we've heard about Keg and Klein would just be coincidences. Yeah, exactly. Or Ron Logan. You know, it's just some things have to be coincidence, I would argue. With this case... I think there's – we know for a fact that with Keg and Klein, there was circumstantial evidence against him. Is that fair to say? Yes. And I think there was motivation to bring charges at, at one time where, you know, the circumstantial evidence, we feel it's strong, charge him. That did not happen. So I I think kind of acting like the Odinism angle didn't go anywhere officially must be due to malfeasance. I don't know. I, again, just knowing what we know about how how much people were pushing for that theory, I, I kind of feel like if there's not enough evidence, if you don't feel like you can have probable cause and then you cannot go forward. Even if some of the stuff sounds good, it sounds good that he's creepy on Facebook and is part of a cult. But you can't, you can't charge someone with being creepy. When we're talking about evidence, uh, the last thing I want to read from this uh, document is uh, their summary of the evidence against their client, Richard Allen. Tony Liggett has testified under oath that there is no DNA linking Richard Allen to the crime scene. Liggett further has testified that he is unaware of anything that that links Richard to the crime through his phone, computers, or electronics. Liggett has further testified that he is unaware of any evidence that links Richard Allen to any weird religious cult group. Jerry Holman has testified to the following. There is no DNA linking Richard Allen to the crime scene. No data extracted from Richard Allen's phone connects him to the murders. No data extracted from Libby's phone connected Richard to the murders. There is no evidence that Richard Allen is or was connected to any other suspects in the case. There is no evidence found on social media that connects Richard Allen to the murders. There is no evidence extracted from Richard Allen's computers that connects him to the murders. There is no fingerprint evidence that connects Richard Allen to the murders. Yeah, it's interesting. I would be curious, is there any evidence of those sorts connecting anyone else? Or is this a situation where it was a forensically, um, you know, there was a dearth of forensics here? What you have connecting Richard Allen is some of the witness statements, uh, which they obviously raise issues with, yeah. and uh, the bullet. The bullet becomes incredibly important if if the witness statements are less than solid. But and we can talk about it later. They they also have some concerns about the bullet. Maybe we'll discuss that in other episodes. Yeah, they, they say that maybe 
the handling of the bullet wasn't properly documented. Right. The bullet becomes very important. And, you know, it, it sort of seems like in some ways it's a case of Richard Allen is probably one of the most surface level boring people to come up in this case. He does not have a criminal history. He's not part of a weird cult. He's not, he doesn't have a documented history of violence. So it's interesting in, in this case with the defense, they're not going with one of the kind of established persons of interest like Logan, like Klein. They're going with something, frankly, even weirder than that, a cult, a cult of Odinus. And it's kind of becoming the the battle between, you know, our boring client versus this very interesting cult that we feel was involved. So I feel like that's kind of ultimately it's going to be interesting to see because I'm sure with the defense, it's like these guys are freaking creepy and they're doing all this weird stuff. And one of them had a personal link to Abby and maybe from the prosecution side, it's like, yes, but none of their, none of them have been ballistically linked to the scene. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. I think the defense is smart in the sense that they're putting out, you know, a, a very strong theory of the case. Of like, here's what we think happened. Because I think people are not going to just accept a situation where we're just picking apart the prosecution's case. They, they're going to want to see, well, who did it then? Yeah, people are going to want to see a bad guy. Yeah, they, people want a bad guy. And if guy. Richard Allen isn't the bad guy, who is the bad guy? Yes. If they wanted to just play it safe, they could have planned to Ronald Logan because he's a dead man. Yeah. These guys are alive, and I'll, I'll be curious about how they respond. If you know any of them and they want to talk to us, let us know. Murdersheet at gmail.com. Or even if you know them and they don't want to talk to us, but you want to discuss your relationship with them. Yeah. Let us know. It's going to be an interesting road forward with this case. Uh, I think that's probably enough for now. Maybe later on uh, in a day or so, we can talk about the other stuff they filed today. And let us know what you think about the theory laid out in this case. Do you find it compelling? Do you have questions? Do you question it? Um, give us give us a shout and let us know what your thoughts are. Another thing we'd love to do later in the week or sometime soon would be to do an episode discussing some of your questions. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, before we go, uh, we recorded an, an interview a while ago with Susan Hendricks. Yeah, she's a journalist. She was previously with HLN. She recently wrote a book on the Delphi murders. And that episode with our discussion with her comes out tomorrow. And I just want to stress that that interview was done prior to the release of this motion this morning. So in that interview, we do not discuss anything in this memorandum. With that said, thank you so much for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.